Hi, I'm Steve Abbott. We're here at the Gerald R. Ford International Airport with Bruce Shettlebauer, the Director of Marketing and Communications. We're going to take a little tour of the airport today. Bruce, what are we going to be seeing? Well, Steve, I thought we'd first off uh, take a look around the terminal building here, uh, which we're standing in currently. Then we'll take a look at our fire department facility, maybe make a stop at our maintenance facility. Then we'll take a look at the uh, air cargo terminal, and then maybe wrap up over at the National Weather Service. Sounds good. Let's okay, go. let's go. Okay, Bruce, tell us where we are. Sure. Well, we're here at the Northwest Airlines ticket counter. Northwest is one of the 12 airlines that we have here at the airport. And what you see going on here is uh, you know, the standard check-in process where customers will approach the ticket counter and uh, they will uh, get checked in for their flight. If they have bags that they're checking, then uh, after they finish the check-in process at the ticket counter, they are required to take those checked bags to one of the six EDS machines, and that stands for Explosive Detection System machines, and those are the large minivan-sized machines sitting in our uh, ticket lobbies. And once the bag successfully makes it through the machine, then the passenger is free to proceed on to their gate, and then the bag makes its way through the process of being loaded onto the aircraft. Uh, after the customer checks in here at the ticket counter, then they will proceed to the security checkpoint at which time they and their carry-on bags are screened and then they can proceed from there onto their gate. What is the heightened security done as far as the costs of both the airport and then to the airlines? Well, right, certainly um, post 9-11 increased security measures have, uh, have been something of a financial uh, burden to both the airlines and airport operators around the nation. Uh, many, many new uh, personnel and uh, equipment and procedures uh, have uh, you know, translated into uh, increased cost for us. Number one is the airport operator. We have hired more law enforcement officers and um, we've had some uh, contracted security personnel that we've brought on board to help us you know, patrol the front curb and some of our uh, vehicle gates on the airfield. And the airlines have incurred some additional costs as well, some of which are um, uh, not talked about publicly uh, and others uh, <laughs> certainly are seen by the public. But uh, you know, suffice it to say that um, post 9-11 security um, has been uh, you know, has been costly. Now, with that said, you know, uh, you know we were we were in a secure environment pre 9 11. It's even more secure today, and get even getting even more secure as time goes on. How many passengers pass through the terminal in a given time period? Sure, we serve about two million passengers every year, and that translates to about five thousand passengers every single day. Wow. Uh, so, uh, pretty significant traffic volume, and interestingly. Last year, 2003, we were up 3% over the prior year, and uh, may not sound like a whole lot, but if you compare it to what happened nationally, nationally traffic was down 3%. So we were, we were bucking the trend in a positive way in terms of a passenger growth last year. Do you have any explanation for why that would be true uh, well, here yeah. in Grand Rapids? A number of different things. First off, uh, though certainly our local economy has, uh, has been on a bumpy ride lately mm -hmm. in terms of layoffs and so forth, relatively speaking, we still have a strong economy compared to many other markets around the country. Uh, secondly, uh, airline service out of Grand Rapids uh, really is good and is getting better. And um, you know, we're attracting passengers that uh, would otherwise maybe use a different airport or maybe otherwise would use a different mode of transportation or maybe wouldn't fly at all uh, as we add service here. And as our fares remain uh, quite reasonable as well. So there are a number of different factors. And I think, Steve, also what you're say seeing is a lot of the things that were keeping people out of airplanes over the last couple of years, such as, uh, well, of course, 9-11 and the effects there, and then the Iraqi war, and the SARS um, mm -hmm. uh, virus, and uh, you know, the downturn in the economy. Some of those things are starting to settle down and kind of play themselves out, and people are returning to the air. We're centrally located to some major cities, too, which, which helps, I suppose. Well, we are, of course, uh, we are the, the major air transport facility in West Michigan, drawing people from Mesquite and Lansing, Kalamazoo, even though those communities have their own airport. Mm -hmm. And that is important in the overall air transport system that local communities have their own local facility. But with that said, uh, we tend to attract people from outside our normal service area. That's great. How many bags get checked through here? Do you have that kind Oh, of no, there's a tough question. How many bags? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say of those uh, 5,000 passengers a day, maybe on average there's uh, one or two bags uh, per person. So uh, a lot of bags go through here on a daily basis. <laughs> What's the uh, number one complaint that customers have when they uh, first come through the check-in area. Well, you know, interestingly, that has changed. Uh, immediately post 9-11, it was the longer lines, the so-called hassle factor. Um, again, some of that's playing out. I think what you're seeing is a traveling public that is much more accepting 
of uh, new security measures, of sometimes longer lines, of the fact that you now cannot bring certain things on board the aircraft that maybe you could bring on board uh, previous to 9-11, all in the name of better security, um, and I think the traveling public is uh, now certainly our partner in that process. It seems like this process moved pretty efficiently from the time we started. Well, it did. Uh, you know, the airlines, I certainly have to give them credit. Uh, they do move passengers through very quickly here. Uh, the TSA, Transportation Security Administration, that screens bags and screens passengers, does a wonderful job here. About 150 employees strong and um, very minimal wait times at this airport. You might find some longer wait times at some of the larger facilities, uh, but of course they're processing more people. Sure. But uh, our folks here do a darn good job. What kinds of jobs might be available for somebody either with the airlines or working at the airport that would be in this area that we're sure, looking sure. at right here? Overall, there's about 2,000 people employed on the airport. Uh, that's a surprise to a lot of folks because typically, let's say, as a passenger, you may come in contact with a half dozen mm -hmm. employees in your process through the airport. 2,000 people employed on the airport, and that encompasses such a wide range of jobs, everything from uh, airline ticket counter personnel and uh, you know, baggage handlers to all the security personnel, either for the TSA or our airport police department. And of course, we have firefighters are going to see that facility in a while. Uh, folks at the uh, you know, food and beverage concessions, car rental agencies. And even moving out of this building, there's all the corporate flight departments and uh, the National Weather Service and uh, wow. you know, a whole host of other employers on the airport. So a big impact on the employment scene for West Michigan. And, and, a, and somebody thinking about a career has a lot of options to choose from here. Absolutely, and I certainly would encourage anyone thinking about a career in aviation to think beyond the traditional careers. Certainly nothing wrong with those traditional careers of pilot and flight attendant and air traffic controller, mm -hmm. but there really are so many more uh, career opportunities that in many ways are behind the scenes, but anyone interested in working at an airport, uh, you know, there are so many options in terms of uh, employment here that um, you know, I suggest that they uh, check those out. Wow. Good. Thanks. Where are we going to go next? Well, I would say we probably could have, head over to our uh, fire department facility. Right. Sounds okay. good. We're here with Jake Collier in the Fire Rescue Operations Unit of the airport. Jake, can you describe for us what we're looking at here? Well, basically, uh, we're a 24-hour operation out here at the airport. We run three shifts of uh, five firefighters on a daily basis. Uh, we currently have three frontline vehicles, uh, two 1,500-gallon per minute trucks, one 2,500-gallon-per-minute uh, truck. We also have a mass casualty unit. We also have an emergency medical service unit that also we use as an incident command post. And we have an environmental trailer that we use to uh, help us facilitate any emergencies that we have at the airport here. Uh, How many uh, firefighters? And Total, we have 15 firefighters and myself for 16 total for okay. the department. And you serve as both fire and rescue then? Or? Primarily, we're here for the aircraft, but we do respond to uh, medical emergencies, hazmat incidents, fuel spills, structure fires. Uh, generally, though, it's just a first-in response, and then we kind of give it to whosoever jurisdiction it happens to be, okay. or we give it to Life Ambulance and they transport. We don't transport or anything to the hospital. How often is there an emergency that calls on your department? Uh, we do about 160 calls a year. Uh, they, they, you know, Sometimes you'll have three in a day, other times you'll go a week without anything. Uh -huh. So it, it really varies. What's the most common situation that we do more emergency medical responses to the terminal than anything else, really? and then it'd be general aviation, and then after that it'd probably be commercial alerts, which, you know, they'll call us out on just about anything. It doesn't have to be anything of uh, any major problem or nothing. Is there any specialized equipment that would be here or uh, protection gear that that your personnel have that would be different from other firehouses? <clears throat> yeah, the difference that we have is turnout gear instead of regular structural gear, proximity gear is what we call it. It basically has a silver coating on it which reflects like 90 percent of the heat from a fire. The regular turnout gear because of the fuel fires are so hot uh, you couldn't approach them. In this t particular type of gear, we can get fairly close and stay in there quite a while because it reflects a lot of the heat away from the firefighter. Uh, we also use foam on fuel fires versus water 
which is a big difference between us and a structured fire department. Uh -huh. So that's why you see the turrets on the top of our trucks and the bumper turrets because uh, we obviously project foam on a fire versus using hand lines with water. What kind of specialized training do uh, your people have to have to work here? Well, all of our firefighters are trained to FAA standards. Uh, we also have hazmat operations level training. All of our firefighters, emergency metal, medical technicians, uh, we also are all qualified for firefighter one and two as state of Michigan. Uh, we try to get the best trained people that we can and we train on a daily basis Monday through Friday. Wow. So good. So uh, students that are thinking about going into firefighting, this is certainly an option for them. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, we do not have an actual fire academy here, though, uh, so, you know, it would serve them best to maybe have some military experience if they could get that or some college classes or be a volunteer firefighter or something like that because we do hire the best qualified at the time. So that'd be a nice pathway for somebody to follow coming to work here. Yes. Great. Thank you. Bruce, where are we now? Right now we're standing at the Air Cargo and Trade Center, a facility that opened up about uh, four years ago. It's a two-building, 160,000 square foot facility. It holds all of the air cargo operations of Federal Express, Emory Air Freight, also the U.S. Customs Office operates out of this facility. And um, this replaced the previous cargo facility that was only one-third the size oh, of wow. uh, the Air Cargo and Trade Center. Interestingly, this facility was 100% leased before we even broke ground on the project, so there was that much pent-up demand for new uh, air cargo processing space. How much cargo goes through here? Uh, the airlines that operate out of this facility handle about 75 million pounds of cargo every single year, and um, that equates to about 200,000 pounds a day. And uh, Federal Express is the primary carrier, and they handle about 75% of the cargo weight. And is there a time of the year where it's busier than, than other times? Or do you notice that? Uh, there's some uh, busier on the you know, holiday shipments, as an example. Um, but uh, you know, these car cargo carriers handle not only uh, personal packages, but uh, they do a lot of shipping of um, uh, raw materials and supplies and parts and finished product in and out of West Michigan. It really is a major player in the economy of, uh, of our region. Uh, this is what I would call one of the uh, kind of behind the scenes uh, uh, components or elements of aviation here at the airport. Uh, most folks uh, think of um, uh, Gerald R. Ford Airport, you think of personal travel, and right. of course that is a major part of what we do here. But certainly air cargo is a major player in um, the economy of West Michigan as well. Well, moving goods from one part of the country to another. Is... Absolutely, right. And so you, can you detect the rhythms of the economy through this? Uh... Yeah, we can, uh, not only on the passenger side, of course, but uh, on the freight side as well. You can see the ups and downs in the local and the national economy. Um, but uh, as we were talking about earlier, uh, West Michigan, compared to the rest of the country, really does have a very stable and um, you know, a strong uh, economy and um, you know, it's diverse, it's not tied to one particular industry. And we see that reflected in our uh, cargo traffic. During the day, right now it doesn't seem very busy. When, when does business pick up here at the cargo it, center? Yeah, we're standing here during the quieter part of the day um, and uh, you know, that's typical for, for midday. Things really start hopping here uh, around the dinner hour and then on through about uh, 11 o'clock at night, which is when uh, over the dinner hours when a lot of the smaller planes come in from around the state, they've picked up freight to some of the smaller airports, they bring it here to Grand Rapids. It's sorted, loaded on to uh, the major uh, uh, freight carriers, uh, the larger aircraft, then flown on to the major cargo hubs around the country. And the hub that's closest to us would be? Uh, matter of fact, uh, since FedEx is the primary carrier here, to use them as an example, they fly two 727s, one of which you can see behind us here. They fly two of those aircraft out of here six days a week. One goes to Memphis and the other to Indianapolis, which are the two main FedEx wow. hubs. So a lot of business comes through it this certainly is. transportation area. That's right, yes. Bruce, talk a little bit about the idea of the airport being a county agency, but right. but technically it's a private enterprise. Well, sure, uh, Steve, the way the airport is set up, the way it's governed is uh, we have a six-member aeronautics board, and those six members are appointed by the Kent County Board of Commissioners, and the aeronautics board consists of three county commissioners and three citizen members, and the aeronautics board kind of sets the policy and the general direction for the airport. Uh, an important uh, point is that the airport is entirely financially self-supporting. 
Uh, we do not utilize any local, state, county, federal tax dollars. Wow. Uh, uh, the operation is entirely supported by the users of the facility, either the end user, the passenger, or the cargo shipper, or our tenants who pay us to do uh, business here on the airport. Uh, so it's a very important, uh, important fact. Something that surprises a lot of people, uh, a lot of folks think, well, your county department, you must be financed by county taxpayer dollars. Mm -hmm. um, that's not at all true. So, and, but there are regulations that have to be followed both at the county and then federal level and so Absolutely. on? Absolutely. Uh, we are a very <laughs> heavily regulated industry, yes, okay. and it's uh, local regulations, state regulations, federal regulations, and uh, in the last couple of years, even more federal regulations right, as we have right. new federal agencies we must either answer to or work with. And um, so between the airlines being so heavily regulated and airport operators being heavily regulated, you know, that's something that, um, you know, we deal with on a daily basis. But, um, you know, back to the, the financing, it's an important point that, um, you know, that the residents here in West Michigan, and specifically Kent County, support the airport if they use the airport, and certainly they benefit from the airport even if they don't ever take a flight. They benefit from the other activities that go on here. But um, in terms of financial support, we utilize uh, no tax dollars. Okay. So. And looking behind us here, there's a lot of land. Talk to me about how big of a space we're, we're looking at. Well, right. Uh, the airport sits on about 3,200 acres, and the uh, that's to kind of put it in a comparison. Uh, about halfway between the size of Granville and East Grand Rapids. So, uh, wow. uh, major uh, piece of land, uh, real estate here. We reside in uh, Cascade Township. So, Cascade Township is our host um, host city, if you will. Uh, parts of the airport are in uh, Kentwood, uh, but uh, the vast majority is in Cascade Township. Interestingly, the terminal building is considered to be the city of Grand Rapids, and it has a whole story behind it going back to when the airport was built, but uh, the, the terminal building is considered Grand Rapids. The rest of the airport, for the most part, is uh, Cascade Township. And as a virtual city, there are a lot of services that are provided here, which would be well. That's right. Of we really operate uh, in many ways like a city within a city. We have our own police department, fire department, maintenance department, administrative offices, and so forth. And uh, so the airport uh, director is in many ways like the, like the mayor uh, of a small city. And uh, we operate also in some ways like a, uh, a landlord in that we lease space. Uh, so it's something like a maybe a mall operator leasing space to tenants who provide the end service or product to the to the uh, flying public. We're now in our airfield maintenance facility which houses all of our uh, airfield maintenance equipment and personnel and uh, of course in the winter time uh, much of the equipment and uh, man hours are devoted to plowing the runways keeping the airfield open during the winter months and then conversely during the spring summer and fall there are hundreds of acres of uh, grass to mow and signs to maintain and um, you know, lights and uh, also work on our pavement surfaces, crack filling, crack sealing, and uh, keeps our folks busy year-round. So. Looks like there's some specialized equipment here that w I wouldn't see in a normal well, plowing situation. That's right. Uh, we, of course, have our uh, plow trucks with the typical blades on the front uh, and the brooms. We have a couple of pieces of broom equipment here. And uh, another piece of equipment was the uh, snow blowers, uh, industrial strength snow blowers. Uh, I'd love to have one for my home. Yeah. You know, one passed down the driveway, you'd be all finished. But uh, we cannot simply plow snow off to the side as, let's say, the road commission can as they're plowing the road. They just plow the snow off to the side of the road. Of course, we can't do that for two reasons. One, we can't create snow banks along the edges of runways for safety reasons. And secondly, if we did that, we'd be burying the edge lights along the runways or the taxiways. So. And the, uh, the FAA maintains standards uh, that uh, says depending on the type of snow you have, you're only allowed to, uh, allowed to have so much snow build up on the runway before you have to plow it. And it uh, depends on whether it's heavy snow or light snow. And um, uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, very heavily regulated, even down to the type and the amount of snow we can allow to accumulate wow. on a runway. Bruce, where are we now? We are at the National Weather Service office, which is located on site at Gerald Ford Airport. And uh, this is where the uh, forecast uh, all the uh, weather patterns and so forth for West Michigan and provide uh, services to the local TV stations and so forth about uh, weather happening in the West Michigan region. Okay, uh, good. I think we'll go inside and uh, have a chance to talk to the chief meteorologist. Sounds good. Okay. Let's go. We're here with Mike Heathfield at the uh, National Weather Service. Mike, could you tell us a little bit about what is in this facility and then what kinds of things happen here? Yeah, we have uh, 22, 23 people. Uh, who work here. 
we have uh, nine meteorologists who work rotating shifts, and then we have a science and operations officer, a service hydrologist, electronic systems analyst, and two electronics technicians, an admi administrative assistant, plus an information technology officer, and uh, five HMT, which are hydrometeorological technicians, or MIT's med interns. Basically, the meteorologists uh, work to break things, and we have three electronics people who, and an IT who fix wow, things. Wow, okay. <laughs> uh, the weather guessers are the ones who break the things. <laughs> Back here, when we get something broken, uh, our electronics staff has got a, got a bench, and they fix, uh, fix anything that the meteorologists break. They also take care of our radar, which is out back. When we built the building, the building cost about $700,000 for the actual structure. But our real investment is in this radar ball back here. That's about $2 million worth of taxpayers' money. Wow. And uh, it, it rotates continuously. The antenna fills the whole inside of that structure. It's about 29 feet across. Unbelievable. And it's constantly rotating and monitoring the atmosphere. We've got uh, antennas. We can communicate with amateur radio across our entire 23-county uh, area. Uh, in this building here, we've got a backup generator so that when, if the power goes down, uh, inside the building, we've got an uninterrupted power source. Okay. So if power goes out, un uh, uninterrupted power source kicks in, and then the generator starts, and the computers never lose their electricity so they don't go down and crash, wow. which is a real good thing. And this is our main operations area. And what you see here is pretty standard, three people working uh, on a given day, a senior forecaster, a junior forecaster and a hydrometeorological technician. Hydrometeorological technician is collecting the data, looking at the data as it comes in, and uh, making sure it's of good quality. The senior forecasters uh, looking at the new model data that comes in and actually editing the forecast graphically. Uh, if you look at the right side of the screen there, you see that he's working on some. Uh, Oh, uh, looks like precipitation grids for um, what for tonight. And it looks like he's thinking we're going to have some scattered snow showers around, maybe a little light drizzle down to the south, and then up to our north, uh, also some scattered snow showers. That sounds like every day, right? <laughs> it's like that movie Groundhog Day. Yeah, that's right. When is this going to end? <laughs> The, uh, on, the, on the screen to his right there is the next rad radar from, so that comes down and gets ingested. And the beauty of this new system, it's called the Advanced Weather Interactive Processing System, uh, is that it takes all the data, the observation data is plotted with the radar data, the computer time syncs it so that the observation data and the radar data are from the same time. And now that data collection process uh, what used to take about two to three hours to do can now be done in about 20 minutes. The data processing has increased, the amount of data we get has increased, and it's all it's to the point where we're getting more data than we could ever really look at. So you got to be pretty smart as you're choosing what products to look at each day to come up with your final and forecast. I think one of the fun things about meteorology is that you come on shift in eight or ten hours, you've got a final product produced and you're done. A lot of businesses, a lot of uh, uh, other career fields, you don't, you don't get that sort of immediate gratification. Of course, you go home and you never know if you're 100% right or not, and it may turn out that you're somewhat wrong at times, but it's, but it's nice to have a product done at the end of the day rather than something that carries out two, three years sometimes on projects. If a, if a student wanted to have a career, here. What, what are the options available to them and where might they go to um, get the training they need? Well, uh, there's a number of different career paths you can take. You can, most people go to a four-year university, get a degree in meteorology, uh -huh. and then uh, sign on as an intern and work up through the intern and then the junior forecaster and senior forecaster position. 
some folks may never want to move beyond that and that's because that's what they like to do. Others may take my path, become a morning coordination meteorologist or a science operations officer, meteorologist in charge. Um, when you started forecasting, how far out could your forecast go with any accuracy compared to today? That's a good question. Uh, when I started, probably 36, maybe 48 hours out, and now our forecasts are routine out to seven days. The accuracy as you go out in time fa does fall off right. uh, because there's more uncertainty of what's going to happen in the atmosphere. But our uh, accuracy for the five-day forecast is now about where it was 20 years ago for the 48-hour forecast. Wow. So they're that still not perfect, but, perfect, but they're getting better further out in time. Which is great for planning all sorts of different things. Yeah, it's wonderful for planning. Yeah. And uh, we're focusing more on the climate and trying to read signals over the entire Earth to make forecasts out into the future that are more accurate for even longer periods. Well, I, I hear that occasionally. They'll, they'll talk about the computer model is, is saying something will happen. Can you talk a little bit about those models? Or is that yeah, something may, we I have Yeah, I can here? show you here, okay. actually. That'd be great. This AWIP system is pretty neat. When I, when I can bring up and I can look at any one of these scales from uh, a very small scale to, uh, to a whole hemispheric or northern hemispheric scale. Mm -hmm. And when I want to look at model data, I can go here and each one of these uh, different entries you see is a different model that's run with slightly different physics and comes up with slightly different answers. Okay. You, we, can, uh, we can overlay the models and then they'll time match between those two models and you can compare them to see how well they're doing as far as being in agreement with one another. And we'll just put up those uh, 500 millibar heights on each one. And you can see that for the first 12 hours there, they're in pretty good agreement and they're matching up. And on days when the atmospheric models like this match up fairly well, you can be fairly confident that the forecast is going to do what the model says it's going to do. And then I've heard that this region of the country is very hard as far as predicting or, or forecasting weather. Is that true? Do the lakes provide that? I've uh, forecasted in Georgia, Texas, Alaska, Kansas, and Texas, and a number of different places in between. Um, every place you go has got its challenges. One of our challenges is an area that is very data sparse, which is the Great Lake of Michigan to our west. We don't know what those storms are doing before they get on shore. And uh, particularly during severe weather, uh, we don't know what that storm is going to do exactly. We can watch it on radar, we can look at circulations, and we can guess. But our shoreline counties often tend to be uh, test cases for storms coming in. Bruce, I wanted to thank you for taking us on a tour today, giving us a hands-on look at the airport and how it impacts our local economy. You bet, Steve. It's uh, my pleasure to tell you this is an exciting place to work and within an exciting industry, and I'm always happy to tell people about what goes on here at the airport. You bet. Look for you on Channel 28. Okay, thank you. <laughs>